Hello, everyone, and either welcome or welcome back to the Jen the Libertarian podcast. If you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and on my Patreon page where you do get early access. Link will be down in the show notes. Before we get into this one, I do have to give a bit of a disclaimer and an apology. I do not know what is going on with Skype's audio right now. Um, I cleaned up the audio on this as best as I possibly could, but I do want to go ahead and apologize for the audio on it. It's probably not going to be the best, but I did still want to get this interview out because I do really like it and I do think it's very informative. But like I said, I just wanted to go ahead and apologize ahead of time for the audio on it. Like I said, I will clean it up as best I can. I do not know if anybody else is having this problem with Skype, but this is probably going to be the thing that finally gets me off my ass and makes me start using Zoom. So silver linings in everything right now. But like I said, just want to apologize in advance. So let's go ahead and get into my interview with Scott Lindsacomb. So today I'm talking to Scott Lindsacomb. He's an adjunct with Cato Institute. And I wanted to talk to him about our current stimulus relief bill thingamajig, which to be fair, is not entirely a done deal yet. We are recording this on Thursday, the 26th at six o'clock. Um, the House is supposed to be voting on it on Friday. I don't see them not passing it, but who knows anymore? Even if this all is completely irrelevant by the time you listen to it, I'm still uploading it anyway for posterity. So, Scott, hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with me. So, as it stands right now, um, this bill is a bit, it seems to me, of a hybrid between a relief bill and a stimulus bill. And we're not, we are not getting hashtag checks, checks, checks. We're getting a check that will be phased in or out depending on your income level. Right. And we also have a lot of back end stuff as far as unemployment, um, loan guarantees, um, a very interesting slush fund sort of thing that makes me nervous. But of what are your initial impressions of this? Yeah, I mean, the initial impression is um, this is classic Washington, D.C. Um, they have taken a relatively simple idea, which, you know, I think even libertarians like me can support um, and have turned it into this just behemoth thing that um, has all sorts of rules and limitations and uh, things that I'm sure we won't even we don't even know about yet that we'll, we'll discover later on that turn what what like I said is kind of a uh, something that that I think again even libertarians can say the government should be doing um, which is a rescue or aid package um, and turning it into this kind of mishmash, of corporate welfare and stimulus and aid. Um, and to go kind of why, why at least I think it's perfectly appropriate for the government to spend a trillion dollars right now helping a lot of Americans is because the government forcibly shut down their lives. Um, and, you know, kind of like Emmett Domain, Domain, as I put it a couple weeks ago, um, Americans are owed just comp compensation for the government coming in and essentially saying, um, through force or incompetence, your life is on hold for the next six weeks, and it may or maybe longer, um, and we need you to trust us that we we got this. And so, you know, for for folks that are dependent on face-to-face -face interaction, or who are, you know, in the so in in a lot of services industry, particularly restaurants, um, a lot of other services. Um, including travel and so forth. And for the folks that then are caught in these um, shelter-in-place or stay-at-home orders, which is now tens of millions of Americans, it actually makes sense that the government steps in and compensates them for lost wages, lost income, lost jobs. So so there's two parts of this that, that like I said, make a lot of sense, and that's either through um, the, the rebates, everybody gets not everybody, but through a check, um, and then through unemployment insurance. Uh, again, um, people who are essentially, when the economy shut down, they got fired, and that makes sense. Um, the the on those uh, programs, the the fine print though is where where things get a little haywire. 
Um, and I'll just take one of them. I mean, I think that the mean the means testing is pretty ridiculous. Um, it's based on 2018 or 2019 ag- adjusted gross income. Uh, 75000 for individuals, 150000 for married couples, plus some extra cash for if you have kids. Um, and the problem with that, of course, is that um, it is irrelevant right now what you or I made it last year. Totally irrelevant. Um, now, you might argue, well, these rich people, meaning above 150 grand, should have had savings or whatever, but that's really beside the point. Um, it's really, again, about the government taking their livelihoods and then being compensated for that. Um, so so you, you have this really hard cap on aid that will, uh, uh, that will miss a lot of people who are, are suffering from rather s- severely diminished uh, income, if any income at all. I mean, you can imagine people on commission right now who maybe made 200 grand last year are now making zero. Um, and they might not see a penny of this, this relief. Um, the other problem with the way that the means testing is done is that it doesn't account for regional disparities in cost of living. So again, you know, 75 grand in New York City is <laughs> uh, a lot different from 75 grand in Montgomery, Alabama. The government is going to treat them exactly the same. Um, on the unemployment insurance side, um, there are there are a lot of um, requirements. Some some that you know make sense on paper, and some that don't. But again, you're getting into a situation where. Um, it is uh, kind of a, again, you take a simple idea and, and lard it all down. Um, so beyond that, then there's, um, you know, the, there are other provisions that do make sense, um, whether it's small business loans uh, at, at zero interest uh, for small businesses that, again, have just been shut down and can't, can't make, um, uh, pay the rent or whatever. Um, and uh, there are also provisions trying to keep small businesses from firing their employees um, because there is a lot of economic evidence out there, a lot of studies that show that you know once somebody is fired, it's actually much harder, often much harder for them to get reconnected to the same job. And so they're trying to encourage employers uh, or discourage employers from firing people, which of course is a bit at odds with the unemployment insurance provisions, which you can only get those benefits if you have been fired. Um, so I guess you have two buckets of folks, you know, folks that have been fired, or folks that we're trying to keep from being fired. Um, and then, you know, you have uh, the industry specific bailouts, and that's where I think things go a little bit off the rails. Um, you know, it's really hard to argue. You know, in that industries that are based in in no small part on travel <laughs> um, would would be should should not, and especially very large companies um, should not have been prepared for potential disruptions in travel. Now, I I think there are there are counter arguments to that, but I think it's a little it's a little less justifiable. Um, and then again devil in the details. You have all sorts of rules in here about how much the CEOs of these companies can make um, and uh, whether the companies can actually increase salaries and all of this stuff. And, and that is um, you know, just kind of populist and political fodder, right? You know, These politicians don't want to be on the hook for companies taking, quote unquote, bailout money and then paying their CEOs a lot, um, and regardless of the justification. So um, so that's kind of the general package. There's specific appropriations. The farmers are, of course, getting some extra money. Um, a lot of departments, a lot of hospitals and medical professionals are getting extra money. There's stuff in there on medical supply chains. On They're going to look at those, which, of course, scares a guy like me who's a big free trader, who, who sees the potential for, for protectionism. No, it's not in there, but it's, of course, something that, that might come down the road. So there's a, those things also um, you know, raise some, some, some concerns. And I remain really confused by this bill just from a pure policy position because I'm, it's like it's trying to do three or four different things yeah. and it's kind of half-assing all of them. Like, especially yes. with the $1,200 check, like, is this supposed to be stimulus or is this supposed to be relief? Because right. And nobody's having that discussion because, like, okay, if it's stimulus, 
then why is it means tested? It shouldn't be means tested. Yeah. If it's relief, yeah. it should be means tested. But what is one twelve hundred dollar check going to do yeah, as far as exactly. relief? Like exactly, and and uh, the way that it's tested has nothing to do with relief um, in the sense that again, basing uh, it should be based in my opinion if they're gonna means test it, it should be based on in loss. Um, in other words, if you made say two hundred grand last year. And uh, now you're only making a hundred grand, um, then you know you qualify. It shouldn't be based on be based on what you made last year. And look, there's a really a relatively easy way to do that, and that is to give everybody money now and then claw it back um, in in next year in your tax returns, right? Um, but again, they they have not done that. It is um, it is like you said, kind of this weird. Um, approach to it, and that's really unfortunate. I can tell you, I actually know someone who um, made good money last year and is uh, essentially getting zero income now, and will not see a penny of this "quote unquote" relief, and that's that's pretty pretty um, unfortunate. And even on the unemployment side, I can see a business especially if you are somebody who is cutting your employees' hours to try to keep them on payroll, or if you are interested in maybe doing one of these loans to try to make payroll, but you look at the current packages set up and you realize that for your employees, between what you would get from the state and what you would get from the yeah. federal government in unemployment, it would be a better deal for them if you fired them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the guy I, I just mentioned is actually contemplating ask, going to his boss and asking to be fired, per, particularly for that reason, that uh, the only way he can get any sort of compensation for, again, the forcible government closure of his business and destruction of his livelihood is um, to basically get fired, it seems, right now. Um, and that's just... <laughs> Um, you know, uh, unintended consequences. Yeah, it's like this just sets up a really perverse incentive structure because even if you look at the additional like 600 a week from the federal government plus what you get from the state, I mean, even conservatively speaking, you could be looking at 900 to a thousand dollars a week. And if you're right. if you're trying to keep somebody on the payroll at say 30 or 30 hours a week, it's likely not going to be 900 dollars a week. So it's kind of like. Yeah. This would be better for you and possibly for me as an employer if I just fired you. Yes, right. right. So, it, it, but, but then there, that there runs. Are, there are provisions in there that, that do the opposite. So, um, you know, to I guess their credit, uh, they are trying to to in, encourage employers to keep their employees. But like you said, I mean, the 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 UI math is pretty clear. That um, in a lot of cases, it's going to make sense for for employers to dump dump their employees. And I, I don't have the text of the bill. I've not dug into it, but I know usually on the state level, businesses are usually responsible for paying out UI if they don't completely like go under. Which I wonder now that I'm thinking about it on the state level, if a lot of these businesses that have been shut down would still be on the hook for state unemployment. But I'm don't think they're going to be on the hook for federal unemployment. So again, there's another incentive for them to say, okay, I'm going to fire you. We'll let the state and we'll let the federal government handle this and it'll still save me money in the end. It'll give you more money. But then again, that also sets up the, the incentive structure against trying to go and get one of these SBA loans because that does have mandatory caps on there on how many people that you have to keep employed. I think it's like yeah. 90%. So it just yeah. sets up really and weird like battling interests. Right. And the other thing I saw, which I think is a really another, you know, very kind of populist move is that they've restricted the, um, if you, so there are a lot of uh, private equity groups and uh, in, you know, kind of big, big time wall street companies that own a lot of quote unquote small businesses. And apparently those businesses are going to qualify for these SBA loans, even though, you know, the, the owners are passive. They basically just, you know, provide capital. Um, and so a lot, there have been a lot of businesses that, that won't even qualify for those. So again, the, the likely outcome is, is going to be just firing all those folks. Yeah. And it just, I hate it for those people, but it, I mean, under this bill, it would be the best thing for them, but 
I also look at the unemployment numbers that came out for last week and wow, that was staggering. Yeah, although again, I think that I, and and judging it from from the surreality of Twitter, I actually think that that was employers getting ahead of it. In in other words, they know that their employees would be better off uh, on getting unemployment, um, and so they. I I think that that was one of the reasons why you saw such a a, a number so quickly is small business employers saying. Well, look, you know, we're not we're not technically shut down by the government yet, but we have we, we have, you know, five percent of our normal customer flow. And so we're basically just going to fire everybody because keeping them on, particularly like workers, um, is is actually worse for them. And that's kind of the position I'm in, too, with my day job is my hours have been cut because of obviously customer flow is not going to be what it was. And that's kind of a different thing that I'm not understanding with this bill and pop possibly popular unpin opinion time. But I think this is all just way too soon, especially on the business slash corporate end, because I have no idea how long this downturn is going to last. And I don't think anybody does. So it's hard to peg like a dollar yeah. amount to it. Yeah, although I would, I would, I would actually argue the opposite. I, I think that this should have been done two weeks ago in terms of, um, at least in terms of the the compensation to individuals and the small business loan facilities, because there, I mean, we we saw the writing on the wall, and companies are already have already been acting clearly, and it's going to take another, I don't know, week, two weeks, maybe longer for any of this to actually impact the real world. So, you know, you're going to need them to issue regulations. They're going to need to cut these checks. They're going to need to figure out how to get the, this, these things in, in place. And so it's going to be what mid late April by the time any of this hits. And so, you know, I know you're right. There's a ton of uncertainty and who knows if these numbers are sufficient, but uh, it actually speed is is really really important right now. I agree, and I wish if, if I had it my way, we would have had two separate bills: one addressing the individual payments, and one addressing business slash corporate payments. But obviously, that's not what we got. We got yeah. this this larded bill instead of this nice clean. Just give people money and then let them handle yeah. it on the on the demand side. Exactly. And, and that's the other thing, right? That, that there were a lot of people, myself included, who were pledging to give any penny that we got immediately to small businesses and charity. And, um, that's a far better way to allocate the resources than to try to do it top down. But of course, you know, we libertarians are ignored and, uh, that, that idea was ignored roundly. Um, and again, I think it, it raises all sorts of issues, not for, People who are lucky enough to keep their jobs with those, uh, again, the the faster, more efficient way to get money in the hands of the people that need it would have been to cut everybody a check. But but we just didn't get that. Because we can't have nice things. But uh, before we wrap this up, um, something that hasn't been talked about a lot yet, but I know this is kind of your wheelhouse, so I want to talk about it, and that is the tariff situation and how yeah. we may possibly be getting – some sort of moratorium on some tariffs from things coming from China, especially yeah, medical no. supplies. Like so, we... in fact, um, it looks like we're getting nothing. Um, the despite the fact that a lot of folks in Congress have asked for tariff relief, of course, the business community is pushing it, um, and even Customs issued this very vague circular about a week ago, saying that they, at the very least they were going to let people defer payments. Um, on tariffs, because again, you know, it's importers paying the tariffs, um, and they were going to let customs was going to let importers at least just not pay for a little while. And customs issued another notice today, essentially clawing that back. Um, and the president, and the White House, have been adamant that there will be no additional tariff relief beyond the standard exclusion process and, and other things. So, so that's unfortunately not going to be the case. Um, you might see additional exclusions granted. For specific products, particularly those that are uh, 
politically salient right now, like medical supplies. But other than that, um, businesses that aren't in that uh, category, uh, importers, American manufacturers, whatever, um, it appears there will be no such uh, uh, benefit. Which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, tariffs yeah, are ridiculous to begin with. But a few things that the president can do with the stroke of a pen. He does not need uh, Congress because Congress has already delegated that authority. He's already exercised that authority. The president could quite easily eliminate uh, tariffs, uh, the tariffs that have been imposed recently, whether it's China or steel and aluminum or whatever. Um, <clears throat> the studies have shown those have had a rather significant impact on American manufacturing, on employment, so forth and so on, um, of course, on Americans' pocketbooks. And unfortunately, um, they're, they're not going to touch it. And, you know, again, it's kind of the heaven forbid we, we, we challenge the president's deeply held incorrect beliefs about who pays the tariffs and whether um, they're actually good economic policy. And especially right now when we're in an economic downturn and you're also talking about things like medical supplies, which we would kind of yep. like them to be as cheap as humanly possible right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, no. In fact, let's face it. Um, the economic nationalists see a really big opportunity to um, impose new protectionism, which it just, you know, for, for somebody like me who, who studies this stuff, it just it's all mind boggling because, you know, not only – does, is increasing the price of medical supplies a bad idea, generally, for obvious reasons? But also, we know from tons of experience and laws on the books now that protected industries are less innovative. They are, uh, they are, they tend to be kind of these zombie, these kind of stagnant zombie industries that don't reinvest any windfall profits, any rents they get from the government. Via protectionism, they don't they they don't reinvest those um, in in new innovation. They reinvest those in lobbying and CEO pay and the rest. And you know, when it comes to steel, that might not be a huge deal. I mean, there's not a ton of innovation in something like that. Uh, medical supplies and pharmaceuticals and these things, no man. I mean, we want the coolest, uh, greatest, most innovative stuff and. To turn uh, the uh, medical device industry and the pharmaceutical industry into uh, the steel industry strikes me as a really horrible, horrible idea. Uh, but, you know, um, again, uh, we're on the outside looking in sometimes, all the time. Uh, despite being told several times that libertarians run everything and it's all our fault that everything's gone wrong. Right, of course, of course. It, it's our economic policy that ruined everything, which oh, yeah. I, I don't know when we ran economic policy. I must have missed oh. that one. <laughs> Look, uh, they need a straw man and, and libertarians and libertarian economics are, uh, are uh, a good one. That and foreigners, of course. Of course. <laughs> everything foreign is bad and globalism is bad. Yeah. But... I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because I know you're kind of crunched for time. And thank you for giving me the amount of time that you have. So this is always the point where I let everybody just promote whatever you want to promote, tell people where to find you, all that good stuff. Yeah, well, you can find me on Twitter at Scott Linsicum. Uh You can also uh, find me at, at the Cato Institute website um, where I write and blog and do all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then I will say, look, there is a silver lining here for us libertarians. Even though they say that, that the pandemic has annihilated all of us, the fact is that you're seeing all over the country um, deregulatory initiatives and other quote-unquote libertarian things, criminal justice reform and occupational licensing reform. Now, granted, these are all temporary emergency waivers, but um, there is a lot of really fascinating, good stuff going on right now um, in the regulatory space in particular um, that that has often and almost always been ignored um, due to entrenched power and corporatism and the rest. So um, we didn't run everything, but um, we are seeing a, a little bit of a silver lining in, in this rather horrible situation we're all in. There is that, and it is nice to see some of these regulations fall away in the face of a pandemic, because now all of a sudden you start realizing, well, did we really need to have these here exactly. in the first place? Exactly. You know, the one that I saw today that's just fantastic is letting foreign 
uh, medical professionals. So people that, that, that have a degree from a foreign medical school are going to be able to practice in New York because they're, they're desperate for, for doctors and nurses and the rest, um, which again raises the question of um, why on earth were we not allowing this uh, previously? And there's a lot of work to be done, particularly in medical services um, and in occupational licensing um, and in cross-border, uh, you know, and I mean international or state border and the provision of those services. So hopefully, hopefully uh, the, the dam will break a little bit there. Fingers crossed, but Bye. thank you for sitting down and talking to me, Scott. Pleasure. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed Scott and I's discussion on the stimulus package and also a little bit on tariffs and the trade deals that are going on right now. And I hope hopefully now you have a little better understanding of what's going on. So as always at this point, thank you. If you made it this far, thank you for listening. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and on my Patreon page. Take care and until next time.